details attended to. I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work, as these are crucial to our success. And now I'm delighted to turn things over to my colleague in the RLP, Chela Weber, who will kick things off for us. Thanks, Marcy. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning from Seattle, <laughs> and uh, which is where I am. And thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm excited to be presenting along with my colleague, Carrie Hintz, uh, about our total cost of stewardship, responsible collection building in archives and special collections publication. Um, so I'm I'm Chayla Scott Weber. I'm a senior program officer with the OCLC Research Library Partnership, where I focus my work on um, archives, special and distinctive collections. And I'll be presenting today with Carrie. Carrie, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Carrie Hintz, and I'm the associate director of the Rose Library um, at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so I'll I'll start things off today and then turn it over to Carrie in a, in a little bit. Um, so to get us started, I'm going to talk to you about our most recent report, the total cost of stewardship, responsible collection building in archives and special collections. And uh, the report is not just a report, it's a body of material that includes a report, an annotated bibliography of sources relevant to the ideas we share in the report, and a suite of practical tools that you can adapt and implement at your own institution. Um, today I'll share a little bit about the context for why we pursued this project, the working group that created it, the some of the major ideas of the report, and then and then give you a quick glimpse into the tools themselves. So as many of you who have been to our webinars before have heard me say, um, OCLC research has a long history of working in archives and special collections because we recognize them as an important site of knowledge creation made possible by the library's investment in the stewardship of these materials. And so we try to support the partnership in making best possible use of that investment in special collections. Our research and learning agenda for archives, special and distinctive collections has been guiding our priorities for work in this area since its publication in 2017. Among the key issues articulated in the agenda were the evolving needs of stewardship and the enduring challenge of descriptive backlogs, um, a desire to re-engage with and rethink appraisal for contemporary collecting, and a real need for tools and skills to be used in advocacy efforts towards supporting archives and special collections programs and valuing the labor that goes into collection care. With these needs around stewardship, appraisal, and advocacy in mind, we convened the Collection Building and Operational Impacts Working Group within the RLP. It brought together a really wonderful group of colleagues uh, who who hold a wide range of curatorial, collection management, and administrative roles in both academic and independent research libraries across the partnership. The work I'm sharing today is due to the efforts of everyone on this slide. I am tremendously grateful to them to their, for their engaged collaboration over the course of the past two years. So as the group started its work, we identified an important disconnect uh, in practice and in communication. We, we saw a disconnect between the way that we were dealing with backlogs and the way we saw them being created. So no matter how efficient technical services became, backlogs kept growing because institutions were collecting beyond their capacity to steward. And we also saw a disconnect between the staff doing this work, especially in large research library institutions. Those tasked with bringing collections in were often not communicating with collection stewards. And so the important skills and knowledge that each of these groups held couldn't benefit the other. And so the working group uh, set out these goals for ourselves. We wanted to explore the intersections between current collecting and collection man management practices, uh, seek ways to better integrate 
collection management and collection development processes, and then and bring together the colleagues across these important and, and interdependent functions. We begin our report by contextualizing it within the conversation the profession has been having about backlogs and resource allocation for at least two decades now, which has focused largely on hidden collections and how to address them through increased eff efficiency and technical services. And we argue that the persistence of this issue makes clear that it cannot be addressed solely through increased efficiency and infusions of resources via temporary labor and that our capacity for collection stewardship must be a regular part of collection building conversations. And while we know and we know that while we're not accustomed to thinking of an that we are accustomed to thinking of an annual collection budget as a constraint on collecting, we are not as accustomed to thinking about our capacity to steward as a constraint. And so we argue that a key to making informed collection de development decisions is a strong understanding of the necessary institutional resources and capacity for the work to preserve, describe, store, and make accessible collection material. In the report, we offer up the idea of total cost of stewardship to consider the full and true resources necessary to care for a special collection acquisition. We define total cost of stewardship as all of the costs associated with building, managing, and caring for collections so that they can be used by and useful to the public. Um, this borrows from the idea of total cost of ownership, which is defined as, an, as the initial cost to purchase something plus the cost of ongoing operation. Um, but it adds an ethical layer to cost considerations. And underlying this definition is the understanding that research libraries and cultural heritage institutions hold their archives and special collections in trust for the public, that we uphold a professional value of providing broad and equ equitable access to rare and unique collections, and the idea that for our collections to be truly valuable, they must be available for use. And in light of this, we see backlogs as a potential breach of trust. They can hurt relationships with donors and creators of collections, and they keep material from being able to be equitably used by researchers. Um, so total cost of stewardship acknowledges that responsible collecting does not stop at acquisition, but considers all of the activities that are necessary to make collections accessible and deliver on our promises to collection donors, creators, and the people and communities those collections document. This approach accounts for the direct costs, like purchase price and other acquisition expenses, as well as the ongoing operational costs of stewardship, like cataloging, processing, preservation, and digitization. In the report, we also offer, we propose a total cost of stewardship framework, which operationalizes the ideas and goals laid out in the report. It's a model of working that considers the value of a potential acquisition and its alignment with institutional mission and goals alongside the cost to acquire, care for, and, and manage the potential acquisition, the labor and specialized skills required to do that work, and the institutional capacity to care for and store collections. We think that working in this model can support planning and advocacy efforts, can help us understand and build capacities around co contemporary collecting formats like AV and Born Digital, and for sensitive and necessarily labor intensive work like reparative description. It can also make sure that new acquisitions support mission and bring true value and that the repository can do the work necessary to support that value. Along with the framework, um, we offer up a tool suite to support it. Um, we've produced two kinds of tools, cost estimation tools to facilitate estimation of tangible costs of addressing collection needs, 
and communication tools to facilitate discussions of both the tangible and the intangible factors that are weighed in collection decisions. All of the tools are designed to bring people together, to support communication, to assure alignment, alignment with mission and goals, and to support consistent assessment of capacity and capacity impact. Each of these tools supports one element of the framework. Um, I'm going to walk you through each element and its associated tools. I won't get into great detail about every tool, but I will spend a little more time on the tools that we think are unique to our work. So the framework starts with documenting collect collecting priorities so that everyone is clear on what you want to collect. Um, foundational to all of this, of course, is the collection development policy. Our collection development policy template supports you in writing a new or examining an existing collection development policy. And while collection development policies certainly aren't a new invention, ours focuses on ensuring that a repository's collections support institutional mission and mission, provides criteria to guide collecting decisions, and can support consistent, careful communication with donors and other stakeholders. The next step uh, in the framework or the next phase of the framework is determining stewardship capacity so that, so that the institution can understand the time, skills, and monetary resources you have available to, add, to allocate to collection needs. Um, to support this, we've created two different cost estimation tools, the operational impact estimator and the quick cost estimator. And I'll show you, I'll spend a little time showing these to you. So first is the quick cost estimator, and it uses existing time estimation models and kind of turns them into an actionable spreadsheet. So it lets you get a quick estimate of the time required to catalog or process materials and what different levels of effort or detail might mean in terms of hours. The um, the calculations, as I said, are based on existing models for time estimation for bibliographic cataloging and archival processing. We use the University of Florida libraries cataloging levels and metrics, uh, as well as the University of California um, and the Ar Archives of American Art archival processing levels and metrics. And then there are also uh, is an opportunity for you to put in your own time estimation models if there's one in use at your institution and have the spreadsheet use that as well. So for bibliographic cataloging, you enter uh, the number of titles you'll catalog at each level of effort, and it gives you a minimum and maximum number of hours that the work is likely to take. Similarly for archival processing, you enter the number of linear feet to be processed at each level of effort, and it gives you a minimum and maximum uh, number of hours for time estimates. Both of these are nice in that they give you estimates kind of per level of effort, so you can think about, you know, who on your team uh, has capacity to do full original cataloging versus copy cataloging, and then it also gives you total hours. Uh, of how much a collection might take. Uh, next is the operational impact estimator, which is a, a bit more of a robust tool. Uh, the, we call it the OIE for short. The OIE allows you to lay out institutional staffing and budgetary capacity for collection stewardship activities, and then assess how a specific collection or potential acquisition might impact that capacity. Um, it's designed to help consider both costs of the work necessary to responsibly care for a collection and then the impact an to an institution's total annual capacity uh, for that stewardship work. Um, it is also a spreadsheet and uh, it starts out by having you lay out the staff roles and associated salaries for everyone who works on collection management activities in your institution. And then you take those roles that you defined in the first tab, and in the next tab, you define the percentage of time those positions actually have to allocate on collection management activities. 
and then you uh, you then you assess the collection that you're thinking about acquiring. You can walk through the collection life cycle from pre-acquisition through to ongoing stewardship and estimate the likely necessary activities, who will do them, and the time that it will take. And then the tool takes all of this data that you've input and brings it together uh, to, to show how the potential acquisition would impact your annual capacity to do stewardship work. It expresses this impact in both time increments and as a percentage of your total annual capacity. The next element of the framework is gather and share information. Um, to gather and share information about the impact an acquisition will have on repository staff and operations to support informed decision making in the moment and responsible stewardship into the future. The operational impact report supports this element of the framework. It's a report that assesses and outlines the cost, time, labor, and skills, and other resources that will be needed to dedicate to a collection to steward it respect, uh, responsibly and effectively. The report pulls together information about a collection that might be gathered on site visits or in pre-acquisition conversations with collection creators and reports on the cost estimates for processing, cataloging, and digitizing collections, along with other impacts to institutional capacities and operations. Um, you can use it in conjunction with those cost estimation tools that I just showed you, but it also has sort of a more narrative um, uh, reporting on capacities such as, um, you know, equipment or skills and things beyond just pure cost. The next element of the framework is make decisions together. And that brings together a shared understanding about the value a collection might bring and the resources that might be necessary to realize that value. And there are three tools that we've created to help support different kinds of decisions you might be making together. The first is the acquisition proposal. Um, and it's a report that helps repositories make decisions about whether or not to acquire a collection. It assesses both the research and institutional value of a given collection and the resources that would be required to steward it. Again, this this report pulls together information and expertise from multiple stakeholders, the kind of information gathered in, in pre-acquisition conversations, as well as the expert opinions on collection value and impacts from relevant staff members, and a report on the cost and impact estimates for processing, cataloging, and other collection stewardship needs. Um, it can be used to provide resource allocators with the information they need to make an informed decision about whether a collection is worth acquiring and if the repository has or can acquire the resources necessary to manage it. Um, the next tool is the processing plan template and it's a document that establishes what work will be done in arranging and describing an archival collection and can also serve as a record of key decisions about work done on that collection. And, and we included it in our I think it's an important communication tool between stakeholders and special collections and can be used to support informed communication and decision making between the processor, their supervisor, and curators or public service archivists who might have important knowledge about the collection, its creation, or its likely uses. And last but not least, we have our digitization project uh, assessment, which also supports the make decisions together element of the framework. It is a document that assesses the viability of a proposed digitization project. We know that digitization projects often require the time, resources, and expertise of multiple people or units, making it even more critical that all parties have a shared sense of the purpose and understanding of responsibilities across a project or workflow. Our digitization project proposal includes a number of elements that will likely need to come from multiple colleagues in your institution, um, including information about the scope of the project, a research and value analysis that assesses how the potential project aligns with institutional priorities, 
And then a project needs and work analysis that's not just about the digitization needs, but other technical, physical, and descriptive needs and how they align with institutional capacity. And then concludes with an assessment and recommendation section for review and comments and an assessment of whether or not the project should move forward. It can help develop and prioritize digitization projects, make sure that they're aligned with institutional goals, and that everyone involved has a shared sense of the scope and purpose of the work and understands the resources required for success. So um, now that I've run through the templates, I'll talk to you a little bit about how uh, we tried to design them so that they can be put to work uh, for you at your institution. Um, so they're designed to uh, complement and be used in conjunction with each other, and they're intended to be flexible and broadly applicable to many institutions. Um, your institution may use one or all of the tools, as is most useful to your circumstance, and will certainly be used in conjunction with other existing tools you're already using. Um, and along with the tool templates themselves, we've included a detail ma detailed manual for the cost estimation tools and a usage guide for the communication tools that include guidance for con consideration for each template and offer links to examples from different institutions for similar kinds of tools so you can think about how you might customize them for your own considerations. And they are customizable. Um, there are Word versions of the templates so that you can fill them out or customize them uh, as you see fit. And the templates are maximal in nature and include many factors that may or may not be relevant in different collecting institutions. So you'll likely want to tailor them to fit your needs and resources and priorities and workflows. The Again, the examples that we point to in um, offer excellent illustrations of how the templates can be adapted to specific institutional contexts. Um, many of you may already have existing policies or document, documents similar to the tools we outline here. So you can use the templates and guidelines to create new documents, or you can to review your existing policies to make sure they're supporting the kinds of communication and decision making you want to enact. And lastly, the communication tools, or all of the tools can be used iteratively throughout the acquisition process. They require input from multiple people and can be refined and updated at various stages as stakeholders learn more about collections and their operational impacts. Um, before I turn it over to Carrie, I want to highlight some upcoming opportunities to learn more and get support for using the total cost of stewardship tools and implementing the framework. Um, we have recorded a set of tutorial videos that we'll be posting to our website in the next day or two, and, uh, and those will be ready on demand anytime you need a little support in using the tools. Um, we're also having open office hours on May 6th, 11th, and 12th. Um, those events aren't quite posted yet, but we'll send some information out about them when we send out the recording of this webinar. Uh, we'll have four sessions total. Two of those will be open only to RLP members, so I encourage you to take advantage of the, your RLP membership and get in on those probably slightly smaller office hour groups. And then on uh, May 20th, we'll be having a Twitter chat where we'll be talking about some of the ideas in the report and hopefully uh, getting some engagement around what implementation might look like in your institutions. And then uh, members of the working group and myself will be presenting at upcoming conferences um, at RBMS, at SAA, and we'll be doing a workshop at the DCDC conference um, from the RLUK in July. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Carrie. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Carrie Hintz, and I'm the Associate Director of the Rose Library. And I am here to talk a little bit about how we have been using and implementing some of these tools, um, some of the communication tools specifically over the course of the last you know, 18 months to two years as we've been developing and testing these as part of the OCLC group. Um, so I will talk about putting some of these into practice and into action. So first I wanna go ahead and um, 
talk a little bit more about me, um, because over the course of my involvement in this project, I have worn a lot of different hats in the organization and seen these tools from a lot of different perspectives. Um, so when I started working on this project, um, my main role was head of collection services at the Rose, which oversees all of the technical services essentially of the library. So the cataloging, um, the stacks management, the processing, all of that kind of work. I was also in the middle of an 18 month stint as our interim curator of literary and poetry collections. Um, so as I was helping to work through and think through these tools and think through this project in my professional um, life, I was doing a lot of collection development, doing a lot of thinking about building collections, working with donors, working with dealers, managing those relationships and, and thinking about the mechanics of bringing in new collections and building on what we already have. Um, and in my current role as the associate director, I am sitting here as an administrator. So my role there is really thinking a lot about resource allocation and resource management, um, whether that is how we fund new acquisitions or being someone who has that kind of bird's eye view of the entire process and, and the capacity of different, different pieces of the staff and different staff members. And then also to tell you a little bit about the Rose Library. Um, we have five major collecting areas. So four of those collecting areas are kind of subject specific and then our university archives. Um, preservation and digitization are separate units um, in our library system and they serve 12 campus libraries. Um, so we are often the biggest customer as the main special collections repository with, within the Emory campus and Emory community, but we are very much not the only customer for those units. And so we need to do some additional coordination um, with them. We are a relatively big shop, all things considered. Um, we have about 25 staff members working across a couple of different teams. Um, and those staff members occupy space on six different floors of the main library building. Um, so while each individual team is usually concentrated in one floor or one space, across teams, we're pretty well dispersed across the building. Um, so we don't have as many of those casual, those opportunities for the casual kind of water cooler conversations or the, oh, hey, I'm just passing by your desk. Let me share this piece of information with you. Um, so I think we have found that we need to be pretty intentional about how we communicate across different teams. So when we look at this total cost of stewardship framework, um, I think what you'll see is we are really particularly interested when we were thinking about how we wanted to implement some of these tools and think through some of these tools to be looking really specifically at that gather and share information piece and that make decisions together piece. Um, those felt like the gaps that we were experiencing um, in the places that we really wanted to focus. So I'm going to be talking today mostly about two different tools and how we implemented them. Um, one is the operational impact report template and then the other one is the acquisition proposal template. So we had some of the building blocks for this in place already. Um, we have always, or at least as long as I've worked at the Rose, when making decisions about a new collection to bring in, um, the curators or other people doing collection development would prepare a one pager um, and take that to the curators group for discussion and some sort of collective decision making. The one pager as one might guess based on the name, is a pretty brief document um, and really mostly focused on the research value and intellectual value of a collection um, and why it might be worthwhile to bring that in and add it to our holdings. Um, and then a little bit about kind of some of the curricular or fundraising connections that they might have, um, but really focused on that, that research value piece of it rather than some of the um, more kind of collection management pieces or or later on down the line downstream stewardship pieces. And that curators group was at the beginning um, just the group of curators and high level administrators. So the um, director and the associate director of the library. So now what we've done is kind of taken those basic building blocks and expanded that workflow a little bit to incorporate some of these tools that um, we're discussing today. So we still have that same 
main information gathering work that is done by our collection development team. Um, so going out into the field, talking to the donors, looking at a collection and getting a sense of what the value is, why it's important, how it connects with other things in our collections, the general size, the scope, um, the formats that are available. And then they bring that information back into the library and have a number of different conversations with different colleagues across both the Rose Library and the libraries in general. Um, so having some of those conversations um, and in this part, particularly with either our head of collections processing or our rare book librarian. And one of those people, depending on if it is a manuscript collection or a book collection, will then draft that operational impact statement that Chayla mentioned earlier. Um, and for us, the, the format that we use, the template that we use is really, really similar to what is in the suite of tools um, that was just published along with this report. So we didn't make any real changes to that. Um, and that operational impact statement, as Chayla mentioned, we'll go through and talk about kind of hard costs of the acquisition of a collection. Um, how much does it actually cost to acquire it, to move it, to ship it for supplies, for labor, um, but then also some of the other kind of ethical costs around, are we able to steward it? Are we the best place for this to be? What are some other questions that we should be asking ourselves or making sure that we are able to address before we commit to this collection? And then that operational impact statement will get included with the potential acquisition reports, um, which includes a lot more information than the one pager. Um, it's kind of a, a built up version of that. And then that report goes into the collection strategies group, which is the curators group that I mentioned before, um, but also in addition to the curators and administrators includes someone from our development team in the library and our accessioning archivist who um, also does a lot of work with managing the acquisitions process. So here's an um, example of the operational impact report. And I know it may be a little bit small, but reading the entire thing is not necessarily the, the point of this. Um, but to show over on the left that we go through those kind of, what is the actual cost to process? What are some additional considerations? Um, but really one of the things that we do with this tool and along with thinking about what are the costs associated with a collection? Um, is this really gives us a great opportunity to ask each other some questions. So in this particular case, that overall assessment piece on the right, um, the first piece about that is, is this collection of a size that we can even bring it into our library or do we need to have it delivered to our offsite storage facility? Like what other assessments do we need to do on different pieces of the collection? to move forward, to think about digitization, to think about conservation. Do we need to be pulling in our conservation team right now um, before we can make a decision about whether we can take this in um, so that they can do a, a preservation assessment of pieces of the collection, things like that. So pieces of it are about accounting, um, but really what this is about is an opportunity to ask questions and to make sure all of the different parties who need to be involved or should be involved or who this may impact, um, this acquisition may impact downstream have a chance to kind of have their seat at the table and make sure that um, everybody is looped in as they need to be. So then we have more conversations. Like I said, that might be with preservation, that might be with digitization, that might be with development. Um, and use that to pull together this potential acquisitions report. Um, so this is, as Trayla said, a little bit maximal. Um, so this report pulls together a lot of that information that we were already talking about. What's the research value? What was the context of creation? What's the size? What formats are involved? Um, and pulls that all together into one place. So we at the Rose um, took a lot of the same kind of questions and information that was used in, in the report that is part of the total cost of stewardship um, framework and work. But we did a lot of kind of tweaking of this. Um, so as you can see, this is a web form um, that we use. We took a lot of those questions and put it into a web form. Um, and it, into chat, uh, we just dropped in a link to kind of a dummy version, um, a mock-up version of our, our web form. So you can go in, play, add in your information, see what it looks like, how we use this, um, kind of how, how it functions. So thank you to my colleague, Megan O'Reardon, for 
putting together this kind of test instance for us. Um, but we decided we wanted to put this into a web form rather than using the kind of word template that we had been using originally um, for a couple of different reasons. One of those reasons is our collection development team requested being able to kind of fill in some of this information when they're out in the field, when they're meeting with donors, um, where they're much more likely to have something like a tablet or their phone with them than to be like sitting down with a big Word document form. So we wanted to make sure that it was flexible and usable in the ways that our, our curators need and want to be using it and engaging with it. Um, by putting it in a web form, it also gave us the opportunity to be kind of maximal in the number of questions that we're giving people the opportunity to answer, but then also to make only certain things required fields. Um, so it gives us a chance to gather as much information as possible or as little information as necessary in order to make a decision, um, which has been really helpful for us. And then finally, one thing that is great about using this particular form is when something is entered into this web form, all of that information is then dumped into a shared spreadsheet where we can do an at a glance look at all of our kind of potential or pending acquisitions that are on the table and see everything in one, one place, one document, um, which is useful for our particular kind of way of working. Um, but again, one of the things that I think is really great about these tools is how flexible they are, how adaptable they are. We took a lot of the information and a lot of the questions and a lot of the things from the template, but we've changed it several times over the course of the last several months that we've been been working with this and that we've implemented this and really we've iterated we've changed we've used different formats we've cut questions we've added questions um so i think again a real reminder that this is something that everybody can use and change to make sure it is working for your own particular institutional context um, and i'll walk you through this really quickly, um, just a couple of screenshots, nothing, nothing crazy, um, but seeing that we're asking these questions about extent type, what formats are there, how does it connect to a collection policy, um, what is the documentation value, what is the research value. Um, it gives us a place where we can upload and connect that operational impact report um, that the curator has already worked on with our head of collections processing or our rare book librarian um, to pull everything together into, again, one place. And now we can talk about some of the takeaways and some of the things that we have learned about this over the course of the last, like I said, about 18 months or so that we've been playing with implementing some of these new tools and workflows. Um, so unsurprisingly, communication and advocacy has been, I think, the big benefit. So one of the concerns um, as we started implementing this is that it asks curators to bring in a lot of information. It really front loads that information gathering and sharing um, and asks folks to do a lot of work kind of at the beginning of the process. Um, but the benefit of that is, as those of us who have done any collection development work know, that when you're coming and you're presenting a collection and you're, there's something that you wanna bring in, your administrator wants to know what is the research value? Like, why does this matter? Why should we have this? What, what value and benefit does this have? Your development person may be asking, what's the cost to process or promote a particular collection? Um, an archivist wants to know the context and creation of use. The context, I'm sorry, the context of creation and use. You know, how how do I understand how this was made and used and what that what that means for an end researcher? Your finance department wants to know the payment terms. Your stats manager just wants to know like how many boxes you expect. So everyone has really different information needs when we're talking about a new acquisition. And by front loading, gathering all of that, it lets someone as a curator or a collection development um, person go in and be able to answer all of those questions and have all of those conversations right off the bat, which has been really useful. Um, the next takeaway is decision making and supporting better decision making around um, helping us think about how do we prioritize different acquisitions if we only have so much time or funding um, or available space. How do we slot different acquisitions in? What is the most meaningful set of material we're looking at uh, around new acquisitions? It helps us plan kind of timing of bringing in different collections to make sure that we have 
you know, the space and the resources and the ability to even just receive the material. Um, so we don't have two 400 foot collections coming on the same day or something like that. Um, and it's been a really great way to have really good, meaningful, collaborative conversations among our collection development team about what it is that we are doing broadly with our collection development strategy and plans. Um, and to bring that together in a, like a more concerted, um, thoughtful and overall strategic way. Um, whereas I think that historically th there had been a little bit of that, but there had also been a fair amount of kind of atomized individualistic collecting practices and, and these conversations um, are helping us think a little bit more, more holistically and um, bring, bring that together a little bit better. One thing that has been a little bit surprising to me is the ability to enhance trust. Um, so I think in a lot of our organizations, information can kind of act as currency sometimes. And the practice of giving somebody the information that they need to do the next step of something um, is useful, but can also feel like withholding full information sometimes. So having one large spreadsheet, one place, where anyone in the organization can go and can see everything that's kind of going on to get every piece of information that they may need or want about a potential acquisition or something that we know is coming in soon um, so that they can plan their own time and that they can plan their own work um, has been a really big benefit for us as well. And then finally, um, workflow management, which is not something, again, that I expected to be an outcome of this particular process. Um, I was thinking much more about other kinds of communication. But because of the sort of online web form and application, the sort of spreadsheet application that we use, one of the things that we can do is go in and add different kind of tags for the stage of acquisition that a particular collection is at. So we can go in and mark that something um, that we've received the deed of gift, that we've sent an acknowledgement letter, that we are working on vendor forms that we've submitted to finance. Um, so especially as an administrator, it's really nice to be able to go in and see um, the exact stage that something is at and to be able to communicate that back out or to, as a curator, to turn around and, and have a, a seller who's like, where's my check? Um, we can go in and actually find some of that information a little bit more quickly and manage those workflows, which has been, again, something that has been really helpful for us in the rows. Um, so I think that that's about it for the presentation of kind of what we have done, how we've implemented a couple of these communication tools. Um, I just want to thank you all for your time. And I looked at the, the attendee list earlier, and we have lots of folks from all across the different kinds of roles in the field. So I'm really excited about the robust questions that you might have for Chila and I. Um, so let's go into questions. Thank you for that, Carrie, and thank you both to uh, you, Carrie, and to Chela for uh, sharing um, your process and, and the takeaways. And so um, uh, we'll get started with questions in a second, but I do just want to encourage everyone while um, Chela and Carrie are here to take your questions uh, to go ahead and, and pop those into chat, send to everyone, and uh, we'll work through um, as many as we can. So um, the first question that I have to ask is uh, from Andrea Lee, and the question is, I noticed that there are considerations for digitization, but what about the factors for accepting born digital, acquired digital acquisitions that frequently involve partnerships and external stakeholders um, and active processing upon receipt? Uh, could you speak to, to that a bit? Um, sure, I can talk about the how where they show up in the tools and maybe Carrie, if you have any experience with this, it, you could jump in too. Um, so we we include born digital as a part of any uh, potential acquisition. Um, so we don't separate it out into its own forms, but for the the um the operational impact estimator the uh the collection acquisition proposal form the operational impact report then the processing plan all of these ask questions about um 
about Born Digital, about format and about capacity. Um, so, so, you know, does it have kind types of Born Digital that you don't have equipment or skills on staff currently to deal with? Would this mean experimentation and skilling up? Would it mean sending things out to a vendor? Um, and similarly, we ask we ask questions like that around AV materials. Um, or is there AV that that you don't have in-house capacity to deal with? Would it need to be sent to a to a vendor? Is there a budget for such a thing? Um, so when we talk about capacity, we have the spreadsheets to try to calculate capacity um, and put numbers to it. But we also the other tools also really try to address capacity. Um, in terms of equipment, in terms of skills, in terms of time, um, and 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 uh, and you know staffing and time capacity. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Andrea. If it doesn't, please feel free to to put an additional question into chat. Yeah, and I'll pop in and say that in practically. Um... One of the things that we do, and again, I think it's built into a lot of our, our practices, the questions that we're asking folks as we're doing that field work and we're doing the initial assessment of a collection is born digital um, is very much a piece of that assessment. The things we're looking at um, what we're communicating back and forth about. Um, we also do have a really short kind of born digital content survey that we have put together that either. Um, a curator who's talking to a donor may be asking that donor to kind of help think through what born digital content is available um, as part of the collection or to help identify that or that our um, digital archivist will have that conversation with a donor to help identify and make sure we're kind of quantifying that born digital content in an appropriate way so that we can plan for it. Great, thank you, Chela and Carrie. That uh, does answer the question. And uh, there is a question about whether the spreadsheets, uh, Chela, that you showed are are all part of this. And I did want to confirm that the um, website, the the link that's been shared, and, and I can pop it in again, uh, which is the portal to the report. You can download the report, uh, the tool suite that that is all included. Um, Chela, I just didn't know if there's anything else you wanted to to just mention in terms of the run through of what's available uh, from that site, um, just to confirm that everything that you shared <laughs> is in fact <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, everything is in fact um, uh, available there. So. Available at that link are the is the report itself, the annotated bibliography, the cost estimation, the two cost estimation tools as Excel files and a, an accompanying manual about use, uh, guiding how to use them. And then all of the communication templates are there both as Word docs that you can download and customize. And then as a PDF, uh, there's a PDF version with the templates and then guidance about how to use each template and some links out to examples of similar kinds of uh, tools at, the, at other institutions um, that we thought were aligned with the framework and nice examples of how uh, how the tools you know are shaped at individual institutions. There is so much great stuff. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to the work of the whole working group <laughs> for really what is clearly just so much work has has gone into that. So I'm so excited that uh, yes, and, and and more to come. And I'm so excited yes, and there will be that. some tutorial videos on that page or linked from that page in the next couple of days as well. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, so then a question from Rachel Matson, which is um, I have a question about whether you've thought. Um, about whether this toolkit could be used to also assess an institution's existing backlog. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah um, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, we definitely framed these tools as being used sort of prospectively, but but the you know the operational impact estimator once you if you use it in a way where you where you say these are all of the resources I have to commit toward collection stewardship over the course of a year, then you can use it to assess any potential project, right? You can say, okay, I've got these three collections in the backlog that I really want to get to this year. Let me plug those numbers into the in here and see how much time 
that's going to take. And then you say, okay, those three collections, it looks like they're going to take 50% of our processing capacity for the year. And that means if we together want to, want to, you know, prioritize those, then that means we have 50% less <laughs> processing capacity for new collections. Um, and so, you know, I think they, they can be used both sort of in appraisal mode and kind of in reappraisal mode, if you will, for looking at the, at the, at what, at collections that already, already exist. Um, and they could also be used for thinking about not just completely undescribed collections, but um, if you want to go back and do more holistic description, do more sensitive description, if you want to um, revisit a collection, uh, you could think about what the work of revisiting a collection for any number of reasons might look like. Carrie, do you want to, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I would say that we have recently tested the um, OIE a little bit um, and kicked the tires on that a bit when thinking about doing some um, grant planning. So I think that certainly thinking about that capacity and how much additional resources may we need in order to accomplish a project is a, a pretty obvious sort of backloggy way to think about that. Um, also, a lot of the questions that we're asking about a potential acquisition are the same questions that we would ask if we were doing a reappraisal project. So how does this connect to the institutional mission? Does it connect effectively to our current um, collection development policy? What are the use cases? I mean, I think a lot of those questions when thinking about how to um, either thinking through reappraisal or prioritizing existing potential work are the same kinds of questions. Well, great. Well, thanks for that, uh, Chayla and Marilee. And then another question that's come in um, from Morag Boyd um, is, could you share about a time when this process led to saying no to a potential acquisition? How did the process help? Was this different from the previous times when a potential acquisition might have been problematic for some reason? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, and I'll talk about something that we're right in the middle of. So it hasn't resulted in saying no, um, but it might. Um, and it certainly has resulted in raising some issues that might end up being deal breakers early enough in the process that we can anticipate them and not find ourselves kind of in hot water after we've made, made some promises. Um, but we're in the middle of contemplating a collection and talking with some donors and um, thinking about moving something forward, transferring something from another library. Um, and one of the really big things that the donors are interested in is there is a fair amount of material that has already um, been digitized or is existing AV that they had recorded of different events and projects. Um, that is already online um, and it's really important to the donor that this material stays online, stays available. Um, a lot of that material has releases that very specifically give that institution an exclusive license to distribute this content. A lot of it has um, some pretty significant copyright impact and that we tend to be a library that is a little bit more risk averse when it comes to making copyrighted material available online. So, um, while this hasn't necessarily a thousand percent made or changed any kind of decision at this point, but since we're still working through it, um, this is the type of type of um, situation in the past where I can very easily have seen us moving forward, signing a contract with that. We have a, we have a digital library program. I'm sure we can figure this all out later kind of um, spirit of like, yes, I'm, like we can do great things. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, and being able to catch some of that at the beginning and make sure that we are going into that conversation with the other party, with the donor party, being able to be upfront, um, being able to really work back and forth what, what they want and need for this collection um, and what they wanna see and to make sure that we can be the responsible parties to, to actually do that work and to do it in the way that the donor desires. Carrie, thanks for sharing that process. Just just having that that transparency around what your process was like um, is is I know uh, really really useful. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, we have another question about how adaptable um, 
is this framework uh, and the tools to special special collections rather than archival collections. Um, I think it's it's quite adaptable to either, and I, I guess um, I'm assuming that what you mean by special collections would be things that are traditionally cataloged bibli bibliographically, um, so books and, and serials and pamphlets and maps and things like that. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the processing, the processing plan is the one document that's really archival in nature, but everything else, uh, tries to take a broad approach that could be, um, so that they could be adapted to, um, to other, so no special formats, not books and manuscripts. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I would encourage you to take a look at, at all of the tools. I do think that they can, they can, they are pretty broadly applicable and can be altered to fit your, your circumstances and your situation. Thanks for that, Shayla. And as we're, um, I think we might have time for one more quick question as we wrap up. Uh, Marjorie Sly has asked, has any thought been given to how these would integrate with data already in a space or crosswalking data generated during this review process into a space? Carrie, are you guys doing any of that? We are not doing any of that right now, but it is something that we are talking a lot about and thinking about and trying to figure out. Certainly one of the reasons that we were really interested in doing such a robust um, potential acquisition form is because we want to pull a lot of these elements into our, our description um, at the end. So we want to be able to have this information about, again, the context of creation and use right from the get-go so that we can incorporate that effectively into the description in terms of thinking about um, sort of technological ways of integrating different kinds of systems to, to automate that. We haven't done that, um, but we are thinking holistically about how this information gets used to make decisions, but then also follows the collection through its life cycle and how this information that we're capturing at these very early stages um, does get integrated into some of those downstream functions like description. Um, although, again, doing some sort of technological integration with ASpace has not been something that we've been focused on in, in this sort of pilot period. Great. Well, thank, thanks for, for answering that, Carrie. And um, we're at the top of the hour. So thank you, Carrie and Shayla, for sharing your insights, these tools with us today. Uh, for attendees, thanks for joining us. Um, and we will post a recording of this webinar um, and this will include the slides, uh, resource links, and we'll follow up with an email uh, when all of those are available. And it will include additional information on registering for the office hours, um, information about the Twitter chat coming up. So lots of opportunities to get some additional questions answered. Um, thanks so much for joining us. And this concludes today's webinar. Have a great day.